Um, and the, the, the attendance, or do you put it up ready? Um, it's in the chat. Yeah, someone just um, put that again in the chat. And okay, and back to the, the lecture itself. And the fetch is a bit different. The fetch is actually an on the client side. And so previously you would have used to say Ajax to get data from the server. So fetch is like the next version of Ajax and it's much, okay. And maybe I would say much is maybe not the wrong word. It's certainly better or more, more modern than the Ajax, almost everyone using fetch now. And there's different libraries built on top of fetch, but I think fetch itself is actually an easy enough. So that's about retrieving or sending requests from the client side, and then how do you handle the response you've got back from the server? Okay, and so the routing is about on the server side, and the fetch would be on the client side. How do you send requests and receive response? Okay, and so we're gonna start with covering what is routing and the features of routing basically when you should use routing and then using routing to split up your apps. So that's one of the advantages and similar to middleware, which allows you to put or break up the code for the request handler into smaller functions. <clears throat> okay. Um, we also talk a little about serving static files. And finally, we actually kind of talked about this last week as well, using middleware to send back um, static files. And finally, we'll talk about the uh, fetch, as we said. And the fetch is used from the client side to send the request and receive the response. Okay, yeah. And so we covered the middleware uh, last week, and we can see when users send a request, and usually they say request and send from the, say, the browser, the middleware will be processed in serial. So it depends on all the appearing in the code. It will run the code in the first middleware. And if it does not end the processing, it will go to the next second middleware, and so on and so forth. And whereas route, usually only one of these routes will be run. Depends on the patterns of the request URL, which is, we'll see that very soon. And so you have one, two, three, or maybe even more routes. And usually only one of these will be picked. Depends on the, there's some checking here. So if the condition is met, then this route will be run. And usually that means the other two will not be run or the rest will not be run. So that's the main difference. Okay, and uh, to explain routing, we need to go a little bit deeper into what the HTTP request looks like. Okay, and so when you want to, or you're typing something like this in your browser, what essentially it does, it would actually first and have a get. That's the type of the request. That means I want to get some information <clears throat> from the server. So this is the path. So besides, so this will be the domain of the website and this will be the path. You can actually follow up with a path and file name as well. And sometimes you only have the domain name then you don't have the path. And then finally, this is the version of the HTTP request. So this is a bit older now. I think by default now, you're always requested, are required to use HTTPS protocol. S stands for secure, which includes encryption. And if it's not, for example, um, Chrome or Firefox actually complain, say this is not a secure website and they probably ask you not to and with it. Okay. And, but that's a bit beyond the, what we need to cover here. So essentially it's what including the type of request. We're going to talk a bit more about different types later on. That's the pass. Sometimes can including file name as well. And finally, the version of the HTTP protocol. <laughs> oh. 
Okay, and then so when you do the routing, you would consider both on the type of the request and the, the path user given, and then decide which response to uh, provide. So if we go back to this one, so basically it depends on the user request, you use the type of request and the URL to request or the path, and you decide whether it's route one, two, or three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so for example, if it's a get request, and if this is the path, and you maybe run function one, and if you have different type of requests and a different path, you run function two. And even it's the exactly the same path, and but yet different type of requests. So either this is now becomes get and the, the path is slash user, you again would run a different function. So maybe in this case will be function three and so on and so forth. <coughs> Okay, and so we start with this very simple example. And um, so these lines you would be familiar. So we request the express or require the express express package or module. So that means we can use it because and then so this assume you already installed that. And uh, we'll cover that how to install express last lecture, or maybe the one before. And this is how you started the express. You always say app equal to express function basically run the express function okay and this is a new part okay and this is actually a route <clears throat> instead of this one this is what we covered the last week which is the middleware and the difference is, is you can say app dot use and if you see dot use that means it's a middleware and then you can see app dot get okay here it means only response if it's a get request okay so that's the clue saying this is a route instead of middleware and as you kind of guessed so the word here should matching the type so if it's for get response you say app.get and you can also say post response and you would say app.post here okay and then you have this which is the path that user have to match. And so if you user only just type in get and it still will not run this code, you have to say and localhost slash Olivia, and then this will be matched because by default, the HTTP requests are get type. <laughs> and you have to follow the specific path here then it will match and then it will run uh, the code inside this function. So, by, so basically both the type and the path have to match before the a route will be selected. Okay. And here, um, I guess it's kind of similar. So the function itself is passed as a parameter. It has a request and a response. Okay. So it does not have a next at the end because we already explained the way the route works, it does not call the next function automatically. So it does not have next, but it always has a request and response. The request including the information about the incoming request, for example, the IP address, I think, and the type of request and the path in the file path, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And the response will be what you send back. Again, the name here is not important. It's the position. So the first parameter always be the request and the second one will be always be the response okay in this case again it's very simple the response it does not it's ignore what actually including the request or does not use any information from the request object which will certainly use later on currently it only sends back a message always say welcome to olivia's home page okay okay and then now we have this, and um, which is app.use. Okay. And so first it's important, and we put this after the app.get. 
And so this will not be wrong first. Because as we explained before, and if you have said dot use, and it's a middleware, and it always be run. So if you have this code before the app.get, and it always run first, and it always going to be sending back an error message, and which is not okay, and not the case we want. So here, this will always will only run, and if this one uh, does not get to run, and because if it gets to run, it will say response dot send a message back. It will end the processing and the request processing. So basically, and it will stop there, stop here once it's colored. And so this will never run. And but if what user type does not match the get and the slash Olivia pass, and it will run here. So it will set set the status and 404. And if you remember, that's the error code for page not found. Yeah. And then we started the app and just say app.listen. So this is probably will be the way we use from now on to and start the server. So this is much even simpler than using the HTTP server from the node itself. Okay. Um, I'm gonna do this um, in the VFC the code. Uh, okay. Ah, route.js. Okay, um, I think I need to still need to. I hope you can see the text if it's too small for you. Just let me know. Um, so I think I will need to install uh, install Express first because this is a new folder. It doesn't have anything yet. And instead of typing install, you can also use I, uh, which is old one. I think, okay, I still type install it. And usually it's better to use install now and because it's more explicit and clear what exactly you're doing. Okay, and so that installs the Express. You can see now I have this node module and inside is all, everything needed to run Express. And also it automatically created the, uh, the package.json for me because I now installed Express, which is shown here. Okay, and now we go back to the route. Uh, as shown here in the lecture slides. <clears throat> so we're gonna first and request the Express. Sorry, require. Okay, and then we're gonna uh, start always using Express from the Express function. Okay, as I said again, so this dot dot here means a router and it has to be get type of request. I'm gonna explain different types very soon. And then the pass has to be Olivia. <clears throat> okay, and then if it's successful, can I use? Uh, oops. Okay, and I'm just testing, gonna be request and response, and gonna be response dot send welcome to Olivia's. ah I'll count you single s here welcome to Olivia's express route mm -hmm. Okay, and so here it will send the response back. Okay, and here I'm using this arrow function, so it's the equivalent of what you see in the lecture slides exactly. 
and I have two parameters. I made the name a bit shorter, one called the request and the response. As I explained earlier, the name doesn't matter, it's the position. The first one is always request, the second one is always response. Then I'm going to have to do the same here. So it has to be called IES instead of the response. Okay, and then after that, we'll do a middleware, which we've covered before. And again, I can use request, request response. Function set the status at 404 means this file and then send file dot okay. and then finally do app dot listen results. Okay. And this last line starts the application. Okay, and then I can start it to run this app. Mm. Ah. Mm. Let me clear this. And there's a way, as we said many times, you can just node in our case what we call the route.js. Okay, and also we talked about this and other command called node mong, which is another module you can install. And it will automatically up restart the server once there's any change. So I'm going to use that. And also, because last time we installed Node Monk globally, we did this. Uh, sorry. Uh, last time we did npm install hyphen g. Hyphen g means you only you install it globally. So any other module will be able to use it or project, NPM project, and you don't have to install it again. And this only applies to these command line tools. There's something you can type in the command line to run. A module like the Express, you can't do it. You have to do it everywhere. So because of that, we don't need to run node mon, or install node mode mon again, and then we can just do one long route. Okay, uh, let me just to see, yeah, I'm in the, Right directory, uh, node mong route dot js. Okay. Right. Okay, one question. Yeah. Is there a difference between response dot send and response dot end? Like, because sometimes we use end, sometimes it's send. Um, yes, there is some subtle differences. And, but for the purpose of this lecture, and either will be fine. Yeah. Okay. You can use either of those. Okay, and you can see now, um, that's starting. And here, okay, if I type in localhost, it's 3000. And even it's a GET request, but it does not match Olivia uh, pass. And it will run this middleware in the sense it will give you an error message. Okay, I'm going to do that now. Okay, it says file not found. Okay. Now I'm going to type in slash Olivia. And now it should match both the get request and the pass. Then it will should run this message. I'll return this message. Okay, it says, welcome to Olivia's express route. Welcome to... <clears throat> okay, and, but for example, if you type in something different, I'm now typing slash Kai, and it will still tell you file not found. So even this get, the pass does not match, and so still get. So the only time you will get, get the, this response um, is when you type in Olivia. And for example, I think even if you're typing the capital Olive, oh, ah, okay, still matches. And so in this case, I use the capital O, it still matches. So it's not case sensitive. You get uh, this response. And how can we have a look at the status code, the 404? Oh, and this one, the status code and uh, does not display on the page. And it's 
a let's just say called in the header section of the response. Uh, we're going to talk more about that later, but we and we'll show you some tools which actually would give you more details about the response itself. Currently, we only see the actual message itself, which is inside the body of the message. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, and then we're going to talk about some of the things you can do. And the first thing you can actually including some parameters in the route. And imagine if you want to retrieve the information about it, a user, and you might want to include in the username or user ID and in the request. Otherwise, you have to create a single route for each user. That's a bit silly. Um, you have 100 users, you need 100 routes, and you have new users, you have to create new routes. Okay. And so you can include in parameter, including user name or ID in the route, then you can query the database using that parameter. Okay, and you can include in uh, the parameter like this. So maybe the path will be slash user slash, and then you define afterwards will be the first parameter using hashtag one. <clears throat> And then this parameter will become available from the request object when you run the app.get or app.post when you create the function. I'm going to see some examples later on. <clears throat> okay. And so this is how we would use. Okay, and so this is still app.get. So this is then this tells you this is a route and it's only for get response. And this tells you the path. And so it has to follow by so the domain name localhost 3000 followed by slash users slash. And then this column tells you this is my first, this is a parameter. And the name of the parameter will be called user ID. And when user type in the request in the browser, user don't need to type column user ID and just replace user ID with something else. Yeah, and we'll see the examples later on. And then the rest will be similar. You actually write the function, which is a code that will be run when the method type and the path matches. Okay, as I said, and the parameter here, you can get from the request object. So this is your request object. So you say request dot parameters, or this is a shorthand for parameters. So P A I M and S. So that's an object including all the parameters and user paths in the URL. Could be because you can have not just one, you can have multiple ones. And then followed by dot user ID. And so the user ID is this user ID here. So that's the name of the parameter you gave when you define. So those two have to be match. Okay. And then here it says pass int. Essentially, it wants to turn this one into an integer. And then 10 means base 10. So you can have a binary and base 10 or even hexadecimal, which is base 16, and so on and so forth. And so by default, all the parameters are treated as string. And sometimes that's not the case because you know the user ID is actually a number. And then you can use this to turn that to a number type rather than say a string type. And then you can do something with it afterwards. <laughs> Okay, and uh, this is actually useful or interesting to know. So if user, user pass, say the users slash one, two, three, up to this point, and it matches this pattern here or this pass here, but again, it has another slash post. So even this part matches overall and Express was saying this still doesn't match. So it will, think, it will not run any code here, but looking for a pattern or pass in, in the routes, which has this pattern. And if there is one, then we'll run that.
Okay. And here, and um, for these two, and both of these will match, and this route, even here, the parameter itself and it's not number. Okay. And in the definitions, you can't, I don't think you can specify this is a number or not. So it will take anything. If it's a string, they will still also take it as it matches. And then it is your responsibility to inside the function itself to write some code to check. If you know it has to be number, then you can check. Otherwise, and if we just do a pass int, it will give you some um, random numbers by converting this word into a number, which does not probably does not make any sense. <laughs> so basically, if you want to check if it's a number, you have to do it it's using your code. And similar, for example, when you're checking the phone number, you, some of you use the regular expressions to make sure what you get is a number, then you can do it here and use the regular, regular expressions inside the route function. Okay, and so this is the called the and parameters. And the, another way would be using a query string. <clears throat> okay, and so if you search, for example, using Google search, and you want to search in JavaScript themed burrito, and so what the URL looks like or sent back to the Google search server could be something like this might not always be. And here, the part after the question mark is the query string. So it started with the question mark and the query keyword and the value for the query. And you can see and JavaScript seemed burrito is almost the same as what you typed in here, except you have this percentage 20 and which is just a represent which is actually the code for the space you have here. And let me see if I say here, I'm typing uh, JavaScript, but I don't know, even though I have to spell burrito. <clears throat> and you can see, well, if you can see here, uh, the query string, so obviously there's a little something, a little bit extra afterwards, there's more, but at least for the first bit, if I copy paste and put them here, you can see it says search question mark Q equal to JavaScript, which I misspelled and plus burrito. Okay. And exactly what the value looks like is not relevant, but the main idea is to see this is a part which we call query string, which almost which kind of similar to, to the parameters you can set the values these are values and for different query keyword in this case just called q and it can be called other, any other things <clears throat> okay and then so if we use express to handle Google search queries, and you would say app.get, so still the get type, and you need to use slash search. So that's the pass slash search. Okay, and if it matches this pattern, so the way to get the query string will be the request dot query. So request will be the request object, which matches here. And so this query is a fixed keyword that is stored all the information about query, a query object. And just as before, here we had a um, request dot and um, params. So that's the object predefined project give you all the parameter information. So here we have to use query dot, sorry, request dot query. <clears throat> and followed by the queue. Uh, the queue here 
is this queue here, which have to match the searching keyword. Of course, the user have to know exactly what keyword to use. They can't just use random keyword, search keyword, current keyword. And otherwise, the parse and uh, the express server might not using that information at all. If not using the one, then it can say, if this equal to, for example, the particular keyword, you can do certain things. And but and more likely is so you would do a database query and use this as the string and to search the database. And then maybe you get a list of websites containing this key and this phrase, and then you can return that back to the cloud uh, browser. Yeah, I uh, kind of mentioned this one. So first, the query is a predefined object, give all the information about query, and the queue here has to match the keyword here. So the keyword after the question mark, you can actually have multiple keywords afterwards. Okay, and so we now covered how to use parameters and using query strings. And I think for this coursework, in most cases, and parameters might be enough. And the next one to use the routers to split up, split up your app and the similar concept. So now you can say for any specific query type and pass, and you can run the specific code. So you don't have to put all the request handler code in one single function. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> and then your then your app can have many uh, different routes. Maybe you have routes for static files, so these will return these files back to the user, and this can be done using middleware. And then later on, and you, that's more likely is you might want to have routes for different um, operations, uh, usually database operations. For example, if you want to do a query. Send the query to the database, and you might want to query, say, the order collection or maybe the user collection. And then you might want to say insert a user or insert an order into the database. So you're going to be using a different type of request <clears throat> and followed by the name of the collection in the database, and so on and so forth. And each of them will be a separate query, a separate route. <laughs> Okay, and then, uh, so I think we will mention the routers as well. So routers, the main difference between routers and the route is, routers is usually in a separate file. So instead of say calling some functions inside, so when you match a certain pass, instead of have all the code here, and you will call a external file. This again is a JavaScript file, just call the files, and then it will run all the code in that particular JavaScript file. And so nothing too special. It just says, for example, if this response is very long, it contains several hundred lines of code, and you probably want to put them in a separate file just to make this main file a little bit easier to see, but not too long. So that's when you use the router. So you have the ER at the end. And in most of the cases, if the code is not very long, a few, a few lines or even a dozen lines, and route, just use a route will be okay, where you have the code directly inside the route function. Okay, and we've seen this um, uh, picture before. So these are the routers, essentially external JavaScript files. And you have the main express application, and inside you have these say app.get slash user. <clears throat> or okay, let's app slash say admin. And instead of running all the code or write all the code, admin code inside the main, you're putting the extra or external files and then put all the code there for the admin panel.
Okay, and the main point is, in, if your an express server is not that long, maybe let's say less than 100 lines of code, or even a particular function is not very big, maybe just 20, 30 lines of code, and you might not need using route, routers. Uh, this is with the ER router, so it might be a little bit overkill. And this is when the app's actually getting much bigger, you need to use the routers. <clears throat> okay, uh, so I'm going to see examples of how to use the routers. I'm not going to write that in the actual uh, VSC code just to save a little bit of time. So, this is the additional files you need to use. And so, you need to require all these external JavaScript file or JS file. And you say, so this that means. That will be inside a subfolder called the routes and your file called API routers.js there. I need to require it first. Okay. And uh, so this is the same as before. And um, we talked about this, say, the pass thing. It's uh, just a built in express, sorry, built in node and building node modules and used to uh, generate the file pass. And this is actually when you arose your router, then you say app.use API. Okay, so here we're actually not doing a route. We're actually using a middleware because it says dot use. It says, or it works more like a middleware. And then when the pass is slash API, and you're going to run the API, the code in the API router. So when we match this pass, you would run some code. This will be stored in this file, which is specified here. And so this is just in comparison. Otherwise, you might have, oh, come on, say instead of that, API router, you might have some function, uh, some code in there directly, like a function which includes extra code. Now, just these codes are moved into an external uh, JavaScript file. Okay, and so this will be the actual um, router underscore JS file. So you can see that's this one here, which is get required. And so these are the code here. So it actually runs the express there. And then say it has, says api.use and so on and so forth. Now, actually you can see now, and this is one of, this is a middleware. In the sense, this will all be run because it says dot use. And also you can see the api.get post. So these are different types of, request is that and four in total or we're going to cover there's actually more and then this is the pass and user so you might want to get user information and you might want to say save a new user to the database and you can use post but you with the same pass and it will run some different code etc etc and you can always need to say uh, module.export equal to api and this is how you make that available. <clears throat> okay, uh, next one, we're gonna, uh, so serving static files. And this is one we did last week. We're using the pass and the file system or FS, these two modules, node modules. And this one um, creates the pass for the files, user requesting. And so this is the directory name. And this one should be the name of the subfolder where the static files are, the PNG file, PDF files, or even zip files. And this will vary, depends on what you call. For example, if you put these static files in the same directory as the JavaScript files, which is a bad thing to do, but it's possible, then here will be empty, nothing there. And then followed by uh, the file name. So 
the user would only including the file name in the request. I mean, it could include in parse as well, but here we assume it's only including the file name. So when you join these three together, you get a completely parse for the file name. So including both the parse and the file name. Okay. And then the actual way to get the file is just run the, I think the file info. So this is one to give you the, I think the static information, it retrieve the files and return these two. The error tells you if there's any error information and this tells you the information, sorry. Yeah, the information about the file and this condition is just to test and make sure it's a file because even there's no error, there's a chance what you return is a directory, not the file. So you still can't send the directory back, or at least we don't want to, <clears throat> or need more code. Then you can say, you send the file, just, this is a building uh, express function, and then you just need to say, send file, file pass, file pass is this one here. <laughs> So all this code really is just checking and the only part actually sending the file back is just this line. But you want to do this to make sure for you, the file does exist and also it's not the directory. Okay, uh, we can do something a little bit easier using express.static. So that's a beauty in express function. Again, so this is something just to make it a little bit easier to do this. And you can, this one still works fine. This one, you just need to write less line of code, that's all. And you can, okay, obviously you request all the require, all the require the modules, and you start as express. Okay, uh, okay. So this creates, the pass to the folder that's including all these static files, but without a name. So it's a bit different. Here we're including the name already, but for the next example, we only use these two parts, the pass of the current directory and the name of the static file file folder. <clears throat> and then, you say app.use express.static pass public pass, a static public pass. So public pass is this one, is the pass for the static folder. And you just say this. Okay, and so that will set up the using static file. And then you can create another middleware which says use function. Okay. So now we're actually starting to see these, which actually creating some information in the, we're gonna explain a little bit later more in later, it says the response user receives actually usually including a head and an actual body. And the body itself can be including say a text message or a string like this, or could be a, actually a, say they call it a binary object, for example, an image or maybe a zip file, depends. But there's some important information in the head. So first is the status code, 200 means, maybe some errors as well, but that will be the status code. But also more importantly, this part, it sets the type in the actual message body. So it will need to tell the browser what kind of message I'm sending. So here it just says content type is text. So that means I'm sending you a text string and then it can say content type is a zip file, or content type is image. And then the browser knows whatever you send afterwards in the body and it's not text, it's an image or zip file. Yeah, and then you start the server. Again, you can say just app of listen 3000, that would be fine. It would also work. Okay, and 
this is getting a little bit more complicated. So in this case, for example, you have a folder specifically for images, another folder specifically for PDFs, then you have different directories. And you can also do that. <clears throat> so you can say depends on the paths. So you can and you can define paths for the images, paths for the zip files, or maybe paths for other files. Then in the variable image paths, and you store the paths for the images. And this will be the subfolder name for the images, it can be different. And then essentially this one, it just join these two together usually. Okay, and then you say app.use slash images. So this one only works, or this middleware only works if it has slash image in the request URL. And then it will return uh, this. Okay, so you can still have this one here. And so when the user did not have, say, slash image in the request URL, then it will just run this to find the file because this one app.us would match the function. So basically that means everything will, <coughs> sorry, app.use here. And would match, and this is actually would um, return the static files, this of the line of code. And also if user have a slash image in the file pass, and it will run the, the code here. And here is actually try to return the file with the name in the image pass. So there'll be a different pass compared to the pass used here, which is the public. Okay. And then you can maybe, it's this doing something very similar to the one before. Maybe this one will be clearer because now we're defining a public pass and image pass, and then these are different passes. And then when users send the request, they have to specify whether they want the files from the public folder or the image folder. All these they have to know how to specify this. And then you do this. And here, for example, the express.static public pass would automatically serve static files from that particular pass, which is defined here and similarly here. So you don't need to do any say error. Uh, you don't have to check whether the file is exist or not, or whether it's a file or folder. And all these handling are done by the express function, the express static function automatically. So it's much easier. <clears throat> okay, and uh, so this again, while it's still sending and static files, but it's much more like a routing. So you can see first we are using app.get now. Uh, we're not using app.use anymore. App.use is for middleware. And so we're using app.get now. And here we can actually include in uh, parameters in the URL. If you remember this column with ID, make this a parameter. And then this is when you can later on to say an request object dot parameters object dot ID to get the values user put in here. And that specifies a particularly pass pattern. The user have to send a request, say localhost slash users slash, uh, I don't know, 22 and slash photos then 22 will be the value here. So this one will give you 22. Okay, and in this case, um, uh, you can just say request.send files. This is a building function, but get portfolio, can get profile, profile photo. 
this is, has to be something you defined or created in your code, which are take virtual take and 22, which is user ID, find this photo, and then the this can send it back to the user. Okay, here we're using the send file and just make it much easier to send files back to the user. <coughs> Okay, and we'll come to the last part, which is about the server side and getting sending the request and getting the result using fetch. Okay, uh, and so this is the stack. And in this week and the week before, or maybe even two weeks ago, we always talk about anything on this side. So we talked about node for a week. And we spend two weeks talking about Express. Okay. And when we now talking about the fetch, the fetch will be sent from your front end, which is your view code. But itself is it's just a standard JavaScript with sending the request, also handling the response from the server. For example, the request maybe say get user slash 22. And you will mark it that response back, which is a JSON object, including all the information about user 22. And this is what the fetch do. The fetch will be inside your front end code, could be inside your uh, view code, or could be just a separate JavaScript function. Yeah, <clears throat> we are not quite done with the Express yet. Still there's more about the routing we need to do. And, but this probably will be after the new year. So today is the, uh, this week is the last week for this year. So we're going to continue after the break, uh, talking more about Express. <laughs> okay, and the way of the communication between the server and the client, so between this part and this part. Okay, and usually you, that's what the server has many computer connected to the server to get data. And, uh, and it used to be static, essentially. And the web page is an HTML file. And then when the page update, even a small update, uh, the server have to resend the entire HTML files, which is a little bit inefficient, especially when the page is quite large and the change on the page is very small. Okay. And then Ajax is to create it to solve these problems. So I believe most of you would have known Ajax and from the uh, second year module, and which allows you to update the page with a small, with only the changing part. Say if you have a page, only a small part changed, and you can use Ajax to get some request back from this, get the changing part from the server and update the page. Okay. So Ajax is associated with XML HTTP request, and which is kind of like the older version, the more recent one will be the fetch. And so that's what we're gonna cover uh, in this module we'll be using. Okay, and use either of these, you don't have to re update the entire page, you only, in update the part of the page that's changed. The rest you can just wait and can remain. Okay. Uh, so this is how you do XML HTTP request. And um, you, this creates a new XML HTTP request object. So it's essentially a class and you create an instance by running its constructor and you store that in a variable called a request. Okay, and then you use the open to create a connection to a server. Then you have to specify the type of connection or request, which will be get, for example, here or post or some other types. And you need to include in the URL 
where the request will be sent it to. So that will be the server name, and you might include some parsing there as well, like slash user. So these are two minimum parts. And sometimes you need other information as well. For example, if you want to and save the record, create a new user in the database, then you have to include in the user information that will be saved into the database in the request as well. And But usually for get, you are getting information from the server, so you don't really send too much other information except the URL of the request. Okay, and then you need to define uh, the type of response you get. So you need to know this beforehand or you know what you're expecting. So kind of similar. So if you remember when we were sending the file or request back, we can set we can set in the response header say so which type of response it is. And here you also set the type of response. In this case will be text. Okay, and this is not strict necessary. And text will be the default type, so you don't need to set it. But if you get if you're expecting any other type, for example, it's an image or zip file, and you need to set the response type. Okay, <clears throat> so and this is the part, and it becomes a bit more and can complicate or maybe more difficult to understand or follow. And so first, and this kind of sending request to a server and then get a response back is a asynchronous an operation. So in the sense, and it can take a while for the send server to send back your response. Okay, and then your in the JavaScript side, it might not wait until you get a response. It might keep continue running the code, which after your request. So you might have eject or fetch request, and you have some other code afterwards. And by default, Java will not stop all the code just to waiting for the response for the server. It will keep running the rest of the code. So that's called asynchronous behavior. And that may create some kind of unexpected uh, behaviors. And for example, you in the say you send a request to the server and the next line of code, you could be using the data sent back, so for example, to display something on the window, uh, on the on user screen. But, and because this is in asynchronous, the JavaScript code will not wait until you get the results back and they will just run directly the, the next line, which is try to display something on the screen. And because by that time, you don't have the data yet. So either get error or display nothing on the screen. That's not the behaviors you want. <clears throat> okay. And so for this kind of behavior, what you want to do is you want to write the code that can only be run after you get the response back in an event handler or something like unload. And you can see for fetch is a little bit different, but for the XHR and or the XML, XML HTTP request, what is XHR stands for. So those are the code which are run only when the response has been received. Okay. And this is good because so the code can still run when it's waiting for responses. Even you never get a response response back from the server. This will not say stop the entire code from running. Okay. Um, so the unload is kind of similar to the event handler and something even like the event handler for say a mouse click. So essentially the code would only run when this event happens. So you, we all done say the mouse click event handler, it only says all oh, this function would only run when this items and DOM objects on the page has been say clicked, this button has been clicked. The same here, 
especially here the event is when the data is received so all these code will run only when data is received so it will not have the problems in when the code would run before the data is arrived okay so here we say the unload so that's going to be waiting and what it, what it does it will alert request dot response okay so these again uh this request is this re request so that's the one we set up earlier yeah we call this xml http request or H um, ajax request what is it could just call the request we creating the connection request.open now we getting the response so we just display the response in a pop-up window and obviously this only makes sense when you get the response so let's say why this unload is so you wait until you get the response back okay and finally you can do request.send so you set up everything we've done before and you do the send okay and so this is put everything together okay and you creating an ajax request give it a name and you set the type of connection the type of request which is get and the url you want to connect to okay and you set the response type as we said text is default but if it's image or other types it's, you need to set otherwise it will not be able to handle the request properly and then you can tell it what do you do after you receive the response because otherwise the code afterwards would run just automatically without waiting for this to the request comes back so this is going to use unload and this is a part which you actually do when you receive the request and finally you send the request after you've done all these setup yeah okay uh, so this is the kind of a little bit uh, trickier part and so and when you try to do this and um, you might get the uh, get an error message uh, like this and so when you try to access localhost 3000 this is what we set here and it's going to be blocked say by the course policy and it says access no access controls allow origin header is presented <clears throat> so and this is um, a kind of security features of the most of the browsers not on the server side on the browser side and what it does to do and um, is to stop the code from accessing a server on a different ip address or domain for example, people by putting some code, malicious code, in JavaScript, which says send your data to a different server or database. Okay, and so essentially that's what this error message means. You're only allowed to access the files from the same domain. In this case, they treat these two as different, even though, okay, so they are different because localhost is actually equivalent to one two seven point zero point zero point one, but the port is different. Sometimes the port is different, for example, just because different port you use for the server or your database. Okay, and what you need to do is you need to say set header access control allow origin star. Star means you allow any origin. So that means you can get the data from a different server. And so this 
is not recommended in the real production code. So that's a little bit unsecure and that potentially means and you can access um, any possible server. Some of them might not be very good. But I mean, for the purpose of doing the coursework, that'd be completely fine. Okay. And alternatively, you can say set the allowed origin, access control allow origin, request.header.origin. So that means I'm going to put to the domain my request requesting into the allowed origin. So essentially, if I'm requesting this one, then I'm going to put this into my allowed origin. Essentially, this request.header.origin will be this. And then essentially, this line allows you to get access to this particular server and port. Uh, did I request.header? So we talked about the header, okay, anyway, and um, we talked about header a little bit early back. In the headers, for example, we set the, and the type of the response, and here we can also just get the origin that it's sent to. Okay, uh, so, and the reason I didn't do any of the live coding for the previous ones, and it's because what you're going to be using for the actual coursework or for this module is actually fetch. So fetch follows a very similar idea as the AJAX or XML HTTP request. And, but this is like the more improved, the modern version, which is slightly easier to use it. And this makes to this asynchronous request a bit easier. Okay. So what it does is says, it says fetch followed by the URL, and then you have the dot then. So the dot then is like the equivalent of unload here. So that will wait until the request comes back. And then you would have a function. So this will be the code that's run where you get the response. And then this is the response you get from the server. You say the response dot text, you basically return or change or convert the response into text. And you have dot then again. So in case, and this one will take some time to complete. And this will say, I'm gonna wait until the conversion to text complete, and then we'll do this one now. Now I have a function called text and just display the text. Okay. And so what we can do now is say, uh, here we already set up a server, and when it's run, it would return some message. So then I can now create a second file, which is on the um, client side, which actually would send the request. Oop, not in here. Um, in demo, can I create? Yeah. No modules. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to call this fetch.html. So I can't, oh, I could run. So I could run, I could uh, create a JavaScript file directly, but I use a HTML file and put the, uh, is this the best way? Maybe I'm put it there. I'm gonna, going to put the JavaScript code there so I can just open the HTML file, which will then run the JavaScript code. I'm going to call this and fetch demo. Okay. And so actually all it does um, is going to try to send a fetch request to the server and then get the response back. And so we can see, 
So first, I'm going to just try to do, if I do search, uh, no, I have to do script. Search local host. Uh, I probably have to do HTTP as well. Local host. Thousand. Okay. I can just do that. And if I don't use anything, uh, this way I'm not going to get any response. And um, okay, uh, let me just go. Let's just go through the the fetch first, and then we'll come back to do the example. And um, so the same line here. So first, you do fetch with the URL. So that's the one you want to the service you want to connect or contact to get the. So this is the equivalent of the request on open in the XML or the Ajax request. And but you don't need to run dot send, and that's okay. And then you say function response. So these here, the dot then is the key. Uh, so that the equivalent, as we said, is the equivalent of the an unload. And here I need to introduce a different name called the promise. Okay, so promise is what's uh, dot then give you. Okay, so promise is something which will happen, but not there yet. So basically, so the response is not there yet. We have to wait for it to come back. That's what's called a pro promise. Um, so the main advantage of Fetch compared to the Ajax is this promising. So the fetch itself would return a promise. So the fetch itself does not return the results directly. It returns promise. It tells that's something that's going to happen in the future. It does not know how long it's going to take before it comes back. Okay. And then you can, for the promise, you can use its dot then method, which is this one here to do something with the return. And on the code in dot then will only run when the promise is, re is resolved. So basically only run when is return is made from uh, the returns comes back from the server. Yeah, as we said, this is the equivalent of the unload. And here we can use the response and object because, and that's automatic. I mean, that's not like the predefined object that we're doing, including the response from the server. Okay, and the text one is what you can convert what you get from the server into text. And the text method or function again returns a promise. Okay. And this is something you can't change. So you can't and um, say you can can't just say console.log response.txt. Um, because it might not give you the actual results, it will give you a promise. So you can't just console log that directly. And then you have to do then again, because it's a promise, you can always have to use then. And uh, before you can use whatever return in the promise. Okay, and finally, inside the Zen for the text, and you can write the actual code to actually use the response. In this case, um, it's just alerting the text. So again, the text will be whatever returned by this function, then you can just display it or console.log. Okay, um, so
Okay, uh, we have a little bit of time. So for example, we're going to do that, that this, this now. Um, and so on the client side, we had the fetch, and we're going to do a then, as we said, and the then itself, if we just go back here, Okay, everything will be inside the Zen itself. And inside the Zen, we can have a function. It will have a response object. So this will be only run where we get the response back from the server and it will be saved in this response object. And what we do is we want to turn this into text. So we can say response dot text. Okay, that returns another promise. So we have to do another then. And then inside again, we'll have the actual test and as an actual text, then we can say display or console log or do more complex things. Okay. And so I've done this now. Uh, what I can do is I can actually run this fetch file and preview in, I think, oh, I need to see the bigger version. Yeah, I'm gonna use this one. It's gonna open this file in the external, sorry, in a browser window. So you probably can't see here, I mean, running the fetch.html in the file, currently I'm not getting any response. But you can see um, from the, eh? on the change side, the server here, you can see it's getting a request and slash demo slash 200, give it a 200. So I was expecting this to generate a, okay, uh, uh, alert, including the text message. And now I'm getting some errors. Okay. So this is exactly the same errors we had, we mentioned in the slides. And so this will be the cross original request security or course policy. And because the headers does not have this. So we are getting the error, so you are not allowed to send this. So as we said in the lecture, so to do that, Ah, I think that's the early one. Sorry, I have to go back. Set header, access control, origin. So this is for here. Ah. So we need to set something. So that's exactly the problems we talk about here. We need to set the fit. Okay. Ah, oh, that changed. It used to be okay. <laughs> so we need to do the equivalent of this and in the fetch. Uh, let me see if I got that in the examples later. Okay, 
<clears throat> I didn't have an example here. And so I probably have to come back to this uh, next week. Uh, actually, now this will be the next year and to continue this. And we will do this equivalent of that to set the allow uh, the access control allow origin, et cetera, et cetera. And so as we only have a little bit of time left, I just want to um, show you very quickly how you can use this in your view code. And so this is what we will, okay. So first is, this is what we have done so far, um, which is kind of the equivalent of these codes we've done. And you can have this fetch um, inside your um, view code. And the first, and um, as we did in the lab exercise, sometimes it does not send back and a text, what it actually sent back is a JSON object. And so before you can use it as a JSON, and you have to use json.stringfy, and this is what you re and received. <clears throat> okay. And so you first the response, and instead of text, you say dot JSON, then this one turns, I try to treat the response as a JSON object. And then you say json.stringfy.json. So this JSON is a response you get. And this one would actually turn that into a JSON object, which you can use and um, in your view code. And so this is actually um, how you might use it in your view code. And so you had a new view object. You may have a products array, I'll say object, or maybe array. And then created, this is a function. So created is a specific, like the special and type of function, which will be run automatically. And when the view instance is created, so when you first load the page, you run this function. And then here is my fairly standard, uh, the fetch, just as we've shown before, you send the request and you get the response you try to convert that into a JSON object. And then you can say store.product. Okay. And the store is my view because it's called store. And then dot product is this product here, which I defined in my data. And you can pass the values of the JSON to the product. So the JSON may contain an array and of product information and this way and you can get it and this is also where if you say this dot product in my work my not work because the this you write here will be referred to this function instead of to the view and instance so that's why it's safer to give the name to the view instance and say store dot product here Okay, and we'll stop there then. And in terms of the reading, uh, that's chapter five for the routing in this book. And also the- Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Um, so I'm having troubles um, putting in the attendance code. I don't know if you could help me out. Um, well, I can't do it now because I have a lab. I have to go to it now, right now, exactly. Now. So maybe you can talk that in the lab this week. Okay, no problem. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um...